Good afternoon. Um, how you guys doing? Um, I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing a lot of people who I think are either passionate about GWT or Dart because um, you could have been downstairs getting your, uh, your Nexus 7, your Galaxy Nexus, and your Nexus Q, but you're here in my session. So thanks for coming. Um, this session is titled Migrating Code from GWT to Dart. Um, and if you might notice, um, I'm tech lead for GWT. My name is Ray Cromwell. And so the first thing you might be asking, and I get this a lot before the session even starts, is why Dart? Why am I even giving a Dart session in the first place? I'm tech lead on GWT. Well, first of all, actually, I think Dart's a really cool language. And I'm a compiler geek, so I tend to like languages and language-oriented stuff. So I volunteered to give this session because, um, to me, learning programming languages is not about discussing which language is best, whether you know, Dart is better than JavaScript or better than Java and so on. Because every language that you encounter has um, things that are good about them and things that are, people will complain about. And so there's, for each type of application, there's always sort of a sweet spot. And Dart is no exception to that. It's, but it is a very cool language. And it takes some of the best features from, from JavaScript and Java and combines them into one. And I'll get to that later. Um, I also think learning new languages is good for your brain, just like bilingualism and spoken languages. If you learn multiple programming languages, it's going to be good for your career. It's going to make you think in different ways, and hopefully exposure to Dart will make you think about designing web applications in different ways, perhaps ways that are um, more structured uh, if you're not a Java programmer. Um, and finally, I don't really think that you can evaluate a language unless you've developed use A lot of times, you'll, you'll, go on the, you'll go online and you'll see people having wars over programming languages. My language is better than yours. They'll cri micro-criticize various parts of the spec. But really, you'll never know what's cool about a language or what sucks about it unless you actually develop with it. And so this presentation is designed to help you utilize what I th you already know, which is pr hopefully Java and GWT, and get you up to speed on Dart as fast as possible so you can try that experiment out for yourself. And then you can make the decision whether or not you think Dart is a good language for you, or GWT is a good language for you, or hand-coded JavaScript is a good language for you. And so I want to try to map concepts that you already know from Java and GWT into Dart so that you understand things faster and quicker. I want to try to teach you some Dart idioms and to get your feet wet in terms of porting some existing GWT application constructs into Dart. So what is Dart? Um, we say it's a structured language for web applications, but it, it, it's more than that. Um, because it, on the surface, it has the appearance of being Java-like. But underneath, it's a dynamically typed language. And so what does that mean? If you think to JavaScript, um, it means that you can refer to things on an object, fields or invoke methods and so on, regardless of what the declared type is. You know, it you might say it's a customer object, but uh, at runtime, you can still refer to that object as if it was a totally different type. The type doesn't restrict you from, from you know, shooting yourself in the foot. Um, but Dart goes a little bit further, because although it, it, you can do that, you can also run optionally your application in checked mode. And in checked mode, the types do have meaning, and you will get runtime errors if you, for example, try to access something on an object or a class that wasn't there in that type. But in general, when you're programming in Dart, unlike in Java, you should treat the types like annotation or documentation for both people reading the code and for machines that are processing it, like tools. Dart's also a class-based, object-oriented programming language. It's not a prototype-based language. It's not functional language. It's class-based, object-oriented. But because it has a type system, and it's, it has, uh, it's OO, it's very toolable. So one of the things you'll be able to do is you'll be able to go out and get things like the Dart editor, which is based on the Eclipse uh, framework, or uh, the latest IntelliJ plugin, and you'll actually be able to get all of the nice stuff that you like in Java in Dart. Command, uh, method completion, field completion, refactoring, go to declaration, all those things are there, things that are actually typically hard to do in dynamic languages. Um, with IDEs, you can do quite easily with Dart. And Dart has the option of running either natively in the Dart VM or in any other browser by using a Dart to JS compiler, which compiles a JS just like GWT. So let's dive right in. Rather than teaching the language spec, if you haven't seen any of the other sessions, I'm just going to start off with Java and try to transmogrify it <laughs> into Dart. Let's see how that works out. 
So the first thing that's different between Dart and Java is basically there's no access modifier keywords. So you can basically just remove the private and public declarations and the code will continue to work. The next thing is that types are optional. So, you know, it's not, we don't always recommend removing types. I think well-written library codes should have the types there so when other people are reading your code, they'll actually kind of know the intent. But just to show you, we can remove that string declaration, that Boolean field declaration, and we end up with that. The other thing is, is that, um, and I actually like this feature, this is one of my favorite features of Dart, is in Java, you write the same code over and over and over again for initializing constructors. You have a constructor, it takes three parameters, what is the first thing you do in the body of the constructor? This.x equals y, this, this.a equals b, and so on, right? It's the same thing, uh, and a lot of other languages have this problem too. But Dart actually has a little bit of syntactic sugar for this. So if you want to auto-assign a parameter to a field, then you refer to the field in the constructor parameter declaration with a this qualifier. So here I'm saying this.name, and that's it in the constructor parameter list. And basically the Dart um, um, VM or the Dart compiler knows that that refers to the field name, which has a string type, and it's going to auto-generate you know, this.name equals name for you. If you have a, a, a you know, it, it, in Java, if you have a block of code in an if statement or a for statement that, that only has one line, you know that you can eliminate the curly braces and just put a semicolon. In Dart, even for method declarations, you can eliminate the curly braces. So here is a method that only has um, uh, one line of code in it, and so the cat constructor just has equals greater than and then an expression to the right of it. And so Dart doesn't have packages, it has something um, that's not exactly like a package, it's called a library. And so here we just delete package com foo and we just use pound sign library foo, which is basically saying the code below it is part of that library. Now, I said that Dart doesn't have access qualifier, uh, like public and private, but you can hide things um, within a library. So you can make it so that no one outside of the library foo can see a particular variable. And the way you do that is by putting a leading underscore on the field name. So in this example, underscore name and underscore icon has meme uh, are only visible to classes within the library um, foo. So Dart doesn't have an import statement like Java, but it does have pound sign import. And with pound sign import, basically you import libraries. And then this is the syntax for it. So we're getting there, we're almost fully converted. Um, so Dart has final fields, um, but they're initialized differently than Java. They're using the C++ style initializer list. So if you have some final fields, they have to be assigned during construction. And so the way you do it is you put a colon after the constructor and then a comma separated list of assignments. Dart also has static fields. So you can see in this example, Ubercat, we want it to be a static final uh, immutable cat, right, that everyone sees. Um, and you can initialize them to be immutable or singleton. Think of string interning in Java by using um, something Dart has called a const constructor. So if you put the const keyword in front of the cat constructor, essentially what this is saying is, is that there's only one, ever one instance of uh, that cat with that parameter name. So if you construct a cat and the name is, you know, um, you know, Mr. Tibbles, then there's only one instance of Mr. Tibbles. And the next time you try to allocate one, you'll still ha get Mr. Tib the same instance. And that means you can use a reference uh, comparison, for example. Another biggie, and this will probably be the biggest shock if you're coming from Java or GWT, is that uh, there's no function overloading in Dart. And so, uh, here's an example, a typical example of Java. It's a money class where it's storing um, things as a fixed point integer, let's say multiplied by 100, so it's in pennies. And so you, someone might have three constructors, one that takes an int, one that takes a string, and one that takes a double. And they might have some overloaded methods. So down at the bottom we have two add methods. One is uh, takes another money class, and one takes another money class but optionally um, charges tax before it adds the, the money. And so Dart works around this problem by introducing named constructors. So in Dart, your constructor does not always have to have the same name as your class itself. 
So in Java, your, your constructor for the cat class is always called cat. In Dart, you have a constructor called money.fromdouble and money.fromstring. So the actual um, qualified constructor name is itself a constructor. So someone, if they wanted to create money from a double, they'd say new money.fromdouble and then the value. Likewise, for the overloaded method case, um, what we can do is we can collapse those two methods into a single method because Dart has optional parameters. So all you do to make a parameter optional is you enclose it in square brackets. So now the original money class, which had um, two parameters, and then another specialized version, which had the emitted parameters, collapsed into a single method, which has the optional parameter. And you can specify default values for the parameter. So typically, in Java, if you have this case where you have two overloads and you, one of them is just an overload because you want to allow the person to emit a, an optional parameter, you typically, like let's say, you typically have one method call the other and pass in the default value. Um, here, you can just specify the value. So I say in the default, if you don't specify charge tax, it's true. Government's going to love that. As a bonus, all optional parameters are named parameters. So if you have a list of like five optional parameters and maybe you don't memorize the API, but you happen to know the names of the parameters, you can specify the optional parameter by putting a colon in front of its name. So I'm passing the charge tax parameter by saying charge tax colon false. And here's an interesting thing. Um, a lot of people complain about Java of people creating tons of factory service locator, factory, factory classes, and things like that. And, and factories and dependency injection are very, very common in Java. And I think Dart recognized this and said, you know, we should provide a solution for this that doesn't, um, you know, add a lot of bloat. And so what you can do is you can designate a constructor as a factory constructor. So here we're saying the money constructor that takes an amount um, is a factory constructor. And what it does is it says, if the amount is equal to zero, then return this static final, like interned instance of zero, else return a new money object that's constructed on the fly. And typically you might do this if you want to use zero as like a special value to use reference equality. Like there's only ever one money object representing zero money, but other ones actually um, have, you know, differing values. And so what happens is when you knew the money object, it actually calls this method. And the method actually can return a different object. Unlike a typical Java constructor, you can't return something from the constructor that's different than the object itself. And Dart also has operator overloading. So we can make that money class a little easier to use by overriding operator plus on it. And now you can just say money dot mo plus money instead of money dot add money. And finally, Dart has getters and setters. So uh, this is a typical POJO, plain old Java object being in uh, Java. And so we have a field called amount, so naturally we have to write an int get amount that returns underscore amount and a setter for it. Um, and down the bottom you see method call from it. Whereas in Dart, what you can do is you can say, um, you can put a get keyword in front of the function name and a set keyword in front of the setter. And then what happens is you can reference the object as if those were field references, not method calls. And Dart will actually invoke the getter methods for you. So this is kind of a less boilerplate way of setting up uh, fields uh, with getters and setters, or properties. Okay. Let's talk about the type uh, system differences. So there's really only five built-in types you, have, you need to worry about. Uh, there are two numeric types. There's int and double. And yes, you're reading that right. The integer is infinite precision, so you never have to worry about um, overflow in your code. You know, you, if you want to compute, um, well, don't try to compu compute Google because you run out of memory, but if you wanted to compute a very large number, uh, you can use integers to do it. Uh, doubles are 64-bit IEEE 754 goodness. Typically, you might have a game or a lot of, like, um, uh, math or physics code, and they're, they're great to use for that. Dart does have a string class. It has a bool type, not boolean, but bool. And it has two fundamental collection types that everybody uses, hopefully, which is list and map. And like every other language except for Java, they're kind of, they have first class support. So there are um, literals um, for maps and lists built into the language. So you can, you define a list literal with square brackets and you define a map with curly braces, much like JSON in G JavaScript. 
there's some big differences with strings between Java and Dart. Strings support interpolation in Dart. So um, you can put a dollar sign and then a variable name inside of any string, and Dart will substitute that with the variable of the same name that's in the same scope. Um, but you can go a little bit further, too. You can put a curly brace, and for example, you can invoke a method call on um, that. And if, if this looks familiar to you, it looks very much like the expression language that's often in many Java frameworks like JSP and JSF and things like that, um, or like Apache prop, uh, ant property substitution. Um, one of the features I love most, actually, is um, here docs, and Dart was um, very good to add that. And it's basically multi-line strings that you can include verbatim in the code. Um, and that's really, really useful if you want to bake in some HTML or some CSS into your app, and you don't have to worry about going in and um, escaping every new line and all the other kind of stuff. You can kind of structure like DSL-specific syntaxes right into your Dart source code just by putting in a multi-line string. And if you don't want interpolation, because you know, maybe you want literal dollar signs, just put an at sign in front of the string and it turns it off for that string. I don't want to say a lot about generics. Um, Dart does have generics, but they are radically simplified generics, which is a good thing, because um, Java generics, I mean, if anybody's played around Scala, this sounds like somebody whining, but like Java generics actually are kind of complicated, and a lot of people don't understand the difference between covariance, invariance, contravariance, wildcards, and things like that. And as a result, most people don't even use those features. I mean, if you're Joshua Block, you use them in the Java collections classes, but if you go look at reg most regular Java programmers, they hardly ever use most of these other extra features. And so Dart basically said, you know, why add all this extra complexity? Most people would just use foo of t, so Dart only has covariance uh, for generics. But Dart does not use erasure, so generics in Dart are actually reified. You can check the runtime type, so a foo int or a list of int, you can actually check it to see what it is. Um, and you, if you try to say, is this a foo of string, it will say false. That's not the case in Java, where if you have a list of t, a list of anything, basically it's only really a list, and you actually cannot check what it is at runtime. But in general, I would say, don't worry too much about this. Things just kind of work, and you don't have to worry too much about it. Uh, generics in Dart are simple, and they work out of the box, and don't get yourself worried about the, what's being left out. The other, and when I say the third favorite feature of mine, is finally lexically scoped closures. I wish Java had them. I wish Java 8 will have them. Hopefully they will, but um, yes. Bye-bye anonymous classes and hello function types. So here is an example of an apply function. It takes a list of integers and applies a function to each thing in the list and returns a new list. And so at the bottom, I just show a simple example. Um, apply to a list, an inline literal list of one, two, three, four, five, a function which basically doubles its input. So what you do to declare a, um, uh, a um, closure is you basically put the parameters in parentheses with optional types, and then you put equals greater than, and then the expression to be evaluated, the function body. You can use curly braces there, too, if you want. Um, and you can make things a little bit more readable because Dart has type def. So often these, like, function declarations, if they're really complicated and they take a lot of parameters, maybe you have a function which takes functions to functions and things like that, um, you want to break them down into separate steps, and with type depths you can do that. And so uh, here I'm basically saying that there is a function that takes an int and returns an int, and I'm going to give it the name transformer. And then my apply function now, rather than saying, if you look at the previous slide, it's int f open parenthesis, int r, close parenthesis. Now this says transformer bay. Uh, maybe some of you get the reference to that. Uh, and so now at the bottom, I have another one where I say transformer prime equals uh, x uh, equals two star x. And so it, it looks a little more readable. Um, you can document the type def and things like that. Okay, so that kind of covers the language syntax um, case. Uh, now I'm gonna cover just some of the API differences. So Dart um, has two collection classes, as I mentioned before, and they are generified. Um, and that's list t and map t. And so in Dart, you can create them in two ways. You can new them with uh, the new operator, or you can construct them in line with literals. 
which a lot of people will do because that's like a very common thing to do. Um, and you don't actually have to worry about the underlying concrete type. So map and list will be like abstract classes, and there might be multiple implementations of map and list, but Dart will pick a default implementation for you. In Java, you have to think, am I going to use hash map, am I going to use linked hash you know, map, and things like that. Um, and in iteration, you have multiple choices, right? So you can use what's called external iteration, where you basically have your own for loop, you ask for the length of the list, and you iterate over it, and you index into it like an array, like list square bracket i. Note operator overloading to access list members. You don't have to say list.getsi. Or you could use the for in operator. So you can say for value in list do something. Or you can use an internal iterator, which is basically uh, you pass a closure to the for each method, and it will loop over the collection internally and call your function for each member of the list. And then there's an equivalent me methods for uh, map. It's just that they take two parameters. Uh, for the for each method, key and value, or you have to get the set of keys or the set of values to iterate over. All right, so now let's actually move on to converting the actual GWT code over to Dart. And so um, let's first convert a really simple example. Here's a hello world in GWT. You have the on module load function, and I'm just going to call window.alert hello world. What would this look like in Dart? Really, really compact. So. First thing is we import the Dart HTML library so we can get the window function, the alert function. Secondly, Dart's entry point is the main function. So, whoops, there we go. Let me restart. I don't know why that, why that happened. Uh, let's go back. I have a lot of slides, okay. There we go, this one. And so if you look at this, you have to have, you have to declare a class, you have to implement the entry point, you have to have an on module load function with access qualifiers, and then you call whenever that alert. Here you just declare a main function and that basically runs whatever code is specified. But uh, a lot of times people are gonna, you know, structure a little more because you don't still want everything running in main, so people might decide to um, declare a class here I have a class called hello, and my equivalent of one module load is the go function. Go function, and then I, from main I just in, create that hello instance and invoke go. So uh, this is a really important point right now. So you know Dart is bleeding edge, and we're working hard on it, and we're working as fast as we can. But we don't yet have a widget library in the SDK that you can download today. One will be available soon. If you've seen some of the other demos, like the Swarm app, some really slick stuff going on, and that knowledge will translate into an awesome widget library. But for now, we just have DOM programming. And so I'm going to compare um, with DOM programming versus Dart DOM programming. So here is, a f here is an example of, um, I might have a div tag with ID button in the HTML, and so I'm going to, add an event listener, a click event listener, to that div tag. And so here's the GWT code that you have to write to do that. So you have to look it up by going document.get, which gets the document element, then get element by ID in the button. Then you have to sync the event, type event you want to listen to. So you use dom.sync dom events. Then you have to set the event listener callback, dom.sync event listener, and have an anonymous inner class callback with a function declared in it, which then has window.alert. So what would that look like in Dart? You just say query, pound sign ID, dot on, dot click, dot add, and then a closure for the event handler. Now there's a couple of interesting things going on here. First of all, Dart has global functions, and so not every method has to be part of a class. So there's a global top-level query function, and it basically kind of acts like the dollar sign function in jQuery, if you want to think of it like that, that. So I'm looking up the button with ID button. And I'm going to get back an element. Now, the element's going to have a magic field on it called on. And on is going to have a bunch of setter properties, like I showed you setters earlier, and it's for each type of event. So here we've got one called click, uh, we've got one, and setters, here, we've got one called, you know, mouse over and things like that. And each one of those is going to have an add method on it. And then, so now I'm just saying, from, for the element that I got back, on click, give me back this click field, click thing, which can then allow me to add a, a closure to it, which will be called. And so that's basically how you would write the same code. 
you look at it again, it looks a lot more readable. And so that's, that's basically converting a hello world and some simple DOM programming. This is kind of where Dart is today. Uh, as I said, there's high level libraries that are on the way real soon now. Um, but for now, it's really an HTML5 experience, which is not always the worst thing. But here's a sort of a high level mapping of like what API in Gwit corresponds to what you have to do in Dart. So if you're using com.google.gwit.dom, you're gonna import the Dart colon HTML library. If you're using UI binder and safe HTML templates and IETA and messages from Gwit, um, you're probably just gonna use Dart string interpolation to do the same thing. If you're doing server communication, in, like Gwit RPC or Request Factory, in Dart right now today, you're gonna use XML HTTP requests. For widgets, of course, Gwit has widgets. Uh, for Dart, real soon now, there's gonna be some cool stuff. And in multi-process, um, for like using web workers, um, Gwit you know, has some third party uh, hacks that add web worker support to Gwit. Dart actually has web workers built into the language as a first class um, construct. They're called isolates. And um, so doing multi process stuff within Dart really has no equal anywhere. They make it really uh, easy to use. So let's try to get a little more deeper and port something more complex. Let's try to port a widget. Now widgets are written in many different ways in Gwit. I'm just gonna focus on the real, the modern way people do widgets in Gwit, which is um, with UI binder. And so the idea here is, is how could I take a Gwit widget that I've written that uses UI binder to define its HTML structure and port that over to Dart. And the general idea here is just to take the UI binder template and then close it in a multi-line string. Convert any of the UI colon field um, attributes to just be ID attributes on the elements. Then build a Dart class to represent, normally what Gwit would generate the bind that template, which is basically looking up the IDs and assigning them to fields in your object. And then you'll have to basically move the raw HTML resources, like CSS resource, um, to be external CSS by using like a link tag to include the CSS. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but it's not, it's not horribly um, bad to port code like this. So here's an example. Um, this is how it looks in Java. I have a UI binder template with a div tag. It says hello span UI field equals name span. And then here I have a little bit of code, uh, which uh, basically calls um, set element UI binder create and bind this. Now if you're a Gwit programmer, you know this works some magic. And what happens is, is it basically generates some code behind the scenes that will take that UI binder template create a div tag and inject that HTML source as an inner HTML into it and put it into the document. And then the next thing it will do is it will go through and it will look up that field, that UI field, UI, uh, the name span. And when it finds that element, it will store it in the field on your class. You can see here this um, name span attribute. So this element will be looked up in the DOM with get element by ID and then put there for you. It's like kind of like a dependency injection. So we want to get that into Dart. So how could we emulate that? So the first thing is we remove the top and bottom XML tags and replace them with triple quotes. And so now we've just um, put it into a multi-line string. And we replace the UI colon field with just ID equals name span. And then secondly, um, next step what we do is we would write a function that will be, you can see right here, which will first, um, create a new HTML element with this, this, the template, which we defined up here. And what this new H element that HTML does is it actually kind of creates a div and injects the string as the inner HTML of it. So what you get back, basically, is essentially what UI binder was doing is a div element with the HTML in it. And then once we get that, we, and put it into the um, DOM, the next thing we're gonna do is do run element.query on it and look up ID name span and then assign it to the field name span here. So Gwit kind of automates that part of it, which is automatically looking up the, the element for you and then signing it, so you actually have to write that code yourself here. Um, but it's not too bad. But you could make it expandable, uh, extensible. So here I have one where I have two name span um, tags in my template, and I have two fields. I would have two fields, like a name span one and a name span two. Instead of having fields on my object, I use a map 
a map from the ID to the element. And then what I do is I say, uh, extend my set element by template function to take the template, which is from up here, and take a list of IDs to look up, which were up here. And then what this is going to do is going to inject this and then document dot query, look up each one of those and inject them into the map for me. And that's what this basically does here. It, it loops over for each ID and then it put, injects into the map the el calling element dot query with the ID. And so that's a way to sort of, uh, sort of uh, make it extensible so you can have an arbitrary number of elements that are looked up and automatically injected for you so you can look them up, you can cache them and look them up uh, later. Well, what about instantiated widgets, though, right? So I just showed you, like, um, HTML tags that are in UI binder templates, but you know that GWT does a lot more. So, for example, you might use HTML panel or menu item or, or tree item and things like that. Well, if it's a le basic leaf widget in GWT, like an input or a checkbox or a text area or something, you can just replace those with the HTML5 equivalents. In fact, for GWT even, we recommend actually not using the heavy wi heavyweight widgets for stuff that's just basic HTML5. It's, it's, it's just uh, too much overhead. But if you have something like a composite type that's like really complex, like a, you know, a, a menu or a tree, um, yes, right now you're going to actually need the code replacements. You know, the good news is you're only do it once, but yeah, you're going to have to write your own tree for now. And I expect that you know, as Dart gets a larger and larger community, even if Dart provides its own widget uh, library, probably other people are going to write their own widget libraries too. Someone will have a fancy tree or a fancy carousel widget or something that you know is not included in the library. So, um, for now, it's a it's an HTML experience, but um, things will get better. Okay, but if you think it's too hard to port widgets, then there's an alternate pattern that you can use to port um, to get your feet wet with Dart. Let's say you have an existing GWT application, and you want to kind of try out Dart, maybe you want to write a new page, you want to add a new page to your application, uh, like a settings screen or like a feedback page or something. And you want to write that part in Dart, but the entire rest of the part you want to keep in GWT. So you want to keep your application running at all times and not sort of like throw everything away and start from scratch. The good news is if you use the activities and places model that's been in GWT for a while, or if you've always been using history tag routing, then um, you could do this quite easily. And the way you could do it is this. You have your GWT application look for history changes or history state changes in the hashtag. And if the history change is one of the things that your app understands, then route the event to the existing GWT code that's going to put up that page. But if it's something you don't understand, then send the message or let it fall through to a Dart application that's running in the same page. So you've source scripted in the GWT module and you've also source scripted in your Dart app. And they're both looking at the history. And if they, tr if they agree not to step on each other's toes, this could work very well. The Dart code could look at it and go, well, I don't understand that history tag, um, so that GWT probably can take care of that one. But I see one that's destined for me, like the feedback page, the new feedback page I wrote. So oh, I'm basically going to um, take over you know, the main content area of the page and replace it with my UI, right? And so that, that gives you kind of a very high level integration um, point for putting Dart pages into your existing GWT apps. Um, you can migrate a page at a time that way. Here's like a picture, like you might have a banking application, um, and so like maybe you have an existing bill payment service, and hash sign bill pay on the URL sends you to the bill pay activity in the GWT app. But you're adding a new page, which is like banking, like maybe bank transfers. And so you've written that one in Dart. So what you do is you just have the Dart um, part of the app that's sitting in the page, look for pound sign banking in the URL, and that's the signal for it to actually take over the content area and install its like view. But if you do this, the very next thing you're going to run into is how do you share application state? I mean, maybe the Dart app, the GWT app just did something, and now the Dart app actually has to get what was changed. And so there are a number of options for this. Um, one option is is use browser storage. So you could use IndexedDB, session storage, or cookies, and have GWT commit um, transient, like session-oriented data, like, let's say the current account or profile represented in the user, and have it commit it to IndexedDB storage in the browser. And then when Dart goes to kick off its view, like you navigate to the, um, you know, 
uh, banking page, then it's going to read from the database and get like things to, related to the user, like his name, his current account, authentication tokens to let him make transfers and things like that. The other option is, is you could put serialized data objects into the DOM. So you know, if you want Dart to, and, and to pick up something that Gwit has to send to it, one op option is just create an element, like a div element, use display none and put some data in there. And then give it an ID, like uh, ID equals um, data object or something. And then just have Dart look it up and parse the JSON out of it. That's another option. Probably the cleanest mechanism is, just to, is to use messaging. And so in your HTML5 browsers, you have window.post message. So you can use this for communication between Gwit and Dart. Have Dart listen on window object for messages and just have Gwit post messages. So you can transfer data back and forth between the two running apps that way. So one thing as a good programmer you're probably wondering about is something like JSNI. And we got a lot of mileage out of that with GWT. Early on in GWT's adoption, you know, there were a lot of JavaScript libraries out there. We didn't have really killer widgets. You know, GWT widgets really looked terrible out of the box. And so people were going and picking up jQuery or picking up ext.js and things like that. And they were wrapping them with GWT. And that really held people over until we could actually deliver better widgets in later versions. And so you might be thinking, well, okay, I'll do that for Dart. I'll use Dart and I'll wrap some cool widgets until, I, until Dart delivers, the Dart team delivers a better widget set. Unfortunately, um, Dart does not have JSNI. And there's a very good reason for that. And so you might think of Dart as it is today as a Dart to JS compiler. But Dart, as it's envisioned, is actually a virtual machine that runs just like V8 does, but it runs Dart code. And so because it's another virtual machine in the browser that's separate from V8, it has a separate heap. So you can't just pass an object reference from one to the other because they live in different memory spaces, probably even different process sandboxes. So um, that, would, that wouldn't be very efficient even if you could pull it off. Um, but there still is a need for you to make calls from Dart to JavaScript and vice versa. There's no question about that. There, there is a need to do that. Like you might want to interact with the Maps API from Google, and there's no Maps, Dart Maps API yet. So there has to be a way to do this. And fortunately, there is a way to do it. Um, there's an unofficial way, quite a few actually, which I'm going to show you. And I'm going to make you a promise that we're, that, that we're actually working on it, and, and actually a real nice solution will be coming later down the pipe. So what are the ways we can do this? Well, one way is, is post-message communication, like I just discussed. So what you could do is you could have JavaScript listen for window.onMessage. And anything that basically comes in through a message, you just run eval on it. And then likewise, in the Dart world, here is, this is Dart code here, uh, you do a post message, and in there you put JavaScript. And then so the JavaScript event handler gets triggered, and it just runs eval. So I've made a call from Dart to JavaScript in that way. Um, it's not pretty, but it works. Another solution that people do, because um, it, it, you, know, you have a little bit more control, is um, script tag injection. So in Dart code, you could just create a script tag, set its uh, text attribute to be the JavaScript text, and then insert it into the body of the browser document, and it will just be evaluated. But that's only unidirectional communication. You can't build an API um, if you can't get any values back after you evaluate the code. You could have bidirectional messaging. So I could send a message to JavaScript and let's say call this method on Google Maps for me. Google Maps that set current longitude equals 10. But the problem is I can't get any return value from that function back. You could make the JavaScript then post the message back to Dart and have Dart listen for a message which has the return value in it. And in that case, it would look very much like asynchronous JSON RPC back and forth between the server. Um, but the API that, that we could be built around that would look pretty nasty. For example, every getter and setter would have to take a closure that, that you'd be called back into with the return value when, it, when it's ready. You gotta remember the browser isn't always synchronous. So if you ask the browser to do something, it could do it immediately, or actually it could do it at like next event loop. And so um, you, you have to basically pass it a callback because it could, it could be executed at a later time. And so this would lead to a really poor uh, API experience. But it turns out there's actually an API in the browser. It's one of the very few uh, synchronous XHRs or another that actually is synchronous, meaning 
um, it actually blocks until it finishes executing. And it's called dispatch event. And what it allows you to do is to fire off an event, like on click or something like that, and it will be handled immediately, not the next time the browser goes to the event loop and, or when it, you know, after all the set timeouts run, and all that, but right now. And so that gives us a hack or sort of a doorway to get true synchronous bidirectional messaging between Dart and JavaScript. And the central way you'll do it is this. Um, you're going to invent a new custom event name. And you can do that in JavaScript. You can make your own events. You don't have to just use like on click or mouse over. And I'll, I'll call it Dart Disney, just for uh, um, quit's sake. And then what you're going to do is you're going to register an event listener in Dart via window.add event listener and look for this Dart Disney event to happen and um, do something when it does happen. And then you're going to construct the serialization format for RPC calls. Maybe you just take the method name and all the arguments that you want to call and you serialize them in a JSON object or something. And you have the callback that's looking for that Dart Disney event, deserialize it and evaluate it. Then you're going to invent another event name, let's call it return Disney. And it's going to take the return value, serialize it, and then fire via window.dispatch event this return Disney method, uh, event. And then in the Dart code, you're going to be looking for window.on on Dart Disney event handler, and that's going to be the return value. And what makes this all work is that when both sides use dispatch event, there is no asynchronicity. You fire the event, it immediately invokes the callback on the JavaScript side. The JavaScript side does the evaluation and invokes dispatch event for return Disney. It immediately runs the Dart event handler, all in one uh, synchronous loop. Uh, this is just a picture of it. It's probably not very useful for you. <laughs> uh, but I tried to draw how it would work. I'm just going to skip that picture for now. So you could make the Disney mappings even more natural, right? Like, what if you just wanted to have a Dart object, and when you refer on that Dart object to any field or, every, or any method, it actually is kind of a mirror or a proxy directly in the JavaScript, kind of represents a JavaScript object on the other side of the fence. And so Dart has two features that actually almost make this look completely natural, and almost like the JavaScript's not even involved. The first is, is operator overloading. So you can implement the operator square bracket, and uh, here I have a class called jazz proxy, and it takes a field name. And then what you do is you make that synchronous call over using that Dart Disney method I just described how you would do, and you I index the field name on the object reference that you're holding on to, this, this proxy ob object represents. And Dart has another feature I haven't described yet. Because it's a dynamic language, what I said earlier was is that you can try to access or invoke anything on an object, even though it's the wrong type, and it will still try it. And if it fails, it doesn't fail completely. What it does is it invokes no such method. So there's a magical method. You can put it on a Dart class and override it, and it will be called for any method that it can't find that someone tried to invoke. And so in this way, you could make a JS proxy class that can invoke any JavaScript method that, that, that exists in the uh, JS VM, by defining a no such method, it takes the name of the method someone's trying to invoke and the list of the arguments, and then you just make a synchronous call using what I just described in the previous slide, and it will um, you know, return the value as if that method existed on the JS proxy object by going to JavaScript and asking it to evaluate it. So that's just another interesting idiom or example you could use. And if you wanted to invoke Gwit code directly from Dart or vice versa, I would advocate using a library I wrote called Gwit Exporter. And what that allows you to do is to put at export annotations on your classes and Java methods. And what it does is it manually declares um, JavaScript um, exports in the top level window object of the page. And then once you've got those things exposed to JavaScript, then you can use the Dart Disney method uh, technique I showed you to just call directly into Gwit. Likewise, if you wanted to do it the other way around, uh, you could export Dart functions into uh, JavaScript by writing a JavaScript function, which when invoked, inv uses the Dart Disney mechanism to send a message over to Dart and say, I'm invoking this method on this Dart class. However, what I've just shown you is it, it's really complicated and it's kind of a hack, and I would not advocate using it except for specialized scenarios like trying to create 
a really nice mapping for like the Google Maps library or some other JavaScript library where it would be painful to have an asynchronous approach. Otherwise, I would suggest just use post message. It's the easiest thing, then the least likely to fail. And for the record, we actually don't know much how, how much longer dispatch will be around. It could very well be that the HTML5 committee could say tomorrow, we're removing that. <laughs> so in summary, I just wanted to say that Dart is a cool new dynamic language. Um, it takes some of the best things from JavaScript, which is the ability to start up quickly without a compile pass, to, um, to have the program run even though the types are wrong. So you can iterate on something even if you've got errors. Um, but also to allow the language to be tooled and tested with compile time static tool chains. It offers um, a lightweight DOM programming library for now, but later on it, it will have a very rich library. That's the whole point of having a structured programming language. They invented all of this new syntax for a type system. They're going to build a really rich library to support it. It's not going to be very raw and basic like JavaScript. Um, try converting some simple GWT libraries. Get your feet wet. Pick the simplest thing in your project and say, like, what would this look like in Dart? Just play around with it. Have some fun. Or integrate, try to make it add a new page to your app by basically writing it in Dart and using the hashtag uh, history routing to, to, to integrate it into the page. Uh, I would advocate, if you're, even if you're not going to use Dart, to look at the GWT activities and places model if you're not using it already because it will help you in the future. Um, and finally, if you're really adventurous, um, try hacking a, uh, a Dart Disney library. Uh, you know, you could probably release it, and if you do it quick enough, everyone might use it. <laughs> so uh, that's my presentation. Hope you guys um, got something out of it, and I'm open to taking some questions. Yeah, you mentioned uh, internationalization and uh, string interpolation. Yes. Um, I, I wonder, do you have an example of that? Um, oh. Like how it works in Dart, and I mean, I'm using it in GWT, but yeah. to migrate some stuff, I'm going to need to move it to Dart. So. Yeah, that's a that's a good question for me. I don't know, do, do you do you happen to uh, know the idiom for doing that in Dart? Uh, what I was thinking of when I wrote that um, was basically using the string interpolation to define the templates for the, um, like you would do in a, in a messages class in GWT, uh, and basically um, create the equivalent of a Dart resource bundle, but using JSON structures, and then write in a little utility library to basically perform the equivalent of what gets code generated in GWT, which is to take the template and basically apply the JSON to it to fill out the template. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I probably should have fleshed that out more. Um, I probably ran out of time doing my slides. Oh, that's fine. Um, and uh, I kind of, I'm looking for something a little bit more formal with the uh, places and activities. Is, is something like that planned for Dart, or is it just like window.on, you know, listening um, for that native event? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I believe the Dart team is working on like rich object models, and they're probably looking at MVC or MVP. Do you happen to know, VJ? So just in case no one heard that, uh, they built a really nice application called Swarm. And what they're doing is they're taking the lessons learned from building that uh, rich UI and the way they've organized it and basically trying to extract um, the libraries and the patterns out of it that they're going to use for Dart. And so um, I don't think that they have anything today that's concrete, but I do believe that, because Seth Ladd is heavily um, 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 involved in, uh, you know, interacting with the, the community who's um, dealing with Dart, and Seth is a really big fan of like MVC and MVP stuff, so uh, it, there probably will be something kind of great, but sorry, I don't know the answer. It's okay, the last question, I promise. Um, when, when I last looked at Dart, it said alpha on it. Do we know when it's going to be promoted? Is uh, Lars or VJ here? Uh, VJ, do you want to take that? I'll just repeat you. Ah. Uh, 
year there'll be a, a more of an official release, but I, I'm not exactly sure. We've said what the date is going to be on that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So Thank later you. this year there will be an official answer. But if you go talk to Lars, just track him down. He's kind of like a very tall guy with glasses. Um, he, he could probably give you a more concrete answer. But I do believe, at least from my own personal experience, the language uh, spec seems to be settling down very nicely now. And so it's probably going to exit the alpha phase <laughs> very soon. Yeah, great, thank you. But that shouldn't dissuade you from trying it, right? Uh, have some fun with it. Just to, sorry, there just to go. add in, we, we do have teams in Google who are starting to use Dart. So you know, even though we're still working on it, it's pretty usable today. They wouldn't be using it if it wasn't. Hi there. Are there uh, any legs to the rumor that uh, GWT is looking for new intermediate language and that intermediate language might be a uh, Dart? <laughs> um, yeah, there's nothing official. There's been some talk about that. I, I know like, I've thought about it personally of building a Dart backend for GWT. So, like, so if and when Chrome actually has the Dart VM built into it, um, you know, it might be the case that either one or two things might happen. Either like someone might build a backend for GWT that emits Dart code, compiles to Dart, just to take advantage of the speed and startup time improvements that the Dart VM will have over V8. The other option actually, and I think this is probably more likely, is that someone will build a tool that actually will help migrate um, Java code to Dart in, in case you want to basically um, port some code over. There are some difficulties in compiling GWT code to Dart because of JavaScript. So you can imagine any JavaScript, uh, any large GWT application at the sort of the leaves of the program, deepest down, is going to have Disney method calls to deal with the browser. And so those would have to be replaced with the Dart library equivalent. So if someone's calling like, you know, dom.getElement by ID, rather than making a Disney call there, which would be really, it would, you'd have to use this hack, it would have to replace it with the equivalent Dart colon HTML library and call the actual Dart method. And it's certainly possible to do that, but it would actually be a lot of uh, mapping work. And, um, but yeah, we've talked about it. Uh, I, nothing official to say. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think there's gonna, uh, when they finally get to release, will they have the widgets? That, and will they be similar to what GWT has already? Um, they probably will be. So I don't know actually the timeline on the widgets, but I know what their philosophy and intention is. And so their philosophy and intention is, is actually to deliver widgets that probably go far beyond what GWT has. So GWT, um, when it started, uh, basically they wanted it to be more like JavaScript. We didn't want to be very opinionated about what the widgets looked like. So the first GWT widgets were kind of very ugly out of the box. They didn't provide very much styling at all. Later, we got some sense knocked into us, and we realized you know, most programmers can't take the time to actually style all their widgets. We should provide some default that actually looks reasonable. And we did that. But still, it's nothing compared to like what Sencha has, for example, right? And so um, that was probably a mistake early in like the GWT um, design. The Dart team, I think, is eyeing the fact that you know, people want to design apps, and, and, and they want to design them and be productive, and they want to wow their consumers. And so you need not just a widget library, you need a very sexy widget library out of the box. And so they're actually aiming to, to, to make you know, something that's very lickable, something that you're going to love out of the box. And it's going to be very opinionated. So you know, your slider widget's going to look like the way the Dart user interface designer wants it to look. And it might not look the way you want it to look, but it's probably going to look really sweet. And so that's basically what they're looking at. Am I summarizing correctly, BJ? Okay. I'm actually not part of the Dart team, so I don't want to speak too much of them. But I, I overheard some conversations. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, I've got a lot of applications on App Engine, and um, is there a pattern or something that I can use to migrate it to that? Uh, you're talking about App Engine? On App Engine using Request Factory. Oh, yeah, you know, uh, I actually slate, was going to discuss this in the presentation, but I realized later I had too many slides and I ran out of time. But if you're using Request Factory, actually, uh, there, I should take this offline. There's an extra bonus because Request Factory is JSON based. It's very possible to make Dart client code work with JSON Request Factory stuff on the server. It's not that true for GWT RPC. GWT RPC is very tightly tied into the Java type system. Request Factory isn't. So actually, it's possible to make a Dart code call server-side Java request factory code. And so maybe I can catch you off, offline and discuss that. Thank you. Hey, OK, so my question would be about GWT RPC. So you've already answered that. So is there some way to uh, invoke uh, GWT RPC calls? Yes. I, yeah. uh, that would be kind of difficult to pull off. Uh, I could see you constructing something that would invoke it. Um, but I would see it being hard to actually deal with the return value. And so um, 
uh, there are Android clients that actually invoke WebRPC because Android also is Java, and so they can deal with the fact that when the return value comes back and it says like it's an array list of doubles or something, the classes for decoding an array list of doubles are already present in the runtime of Dalvik, right? With Dart, if you invoke some server-side call and you get back an array of things that are Java types, right, there's not necessarily something to map to decode those and demarshal them into on the Dart side. So it's a little more difficult. But invoking, I could see, uh, there, as long as your API actually uses mostly primitive things like longs and integers and strings and so on, or maybe uh, POJOs, I think you could pull it off. Um, but if you catch me outside, I might have some suggestions for okay, that. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Hello. Uh, at the previous uh, Google Our conference, Oops. we have uh, many talks about Google Web Toolkit. We have a, a separate uh, section in developer sandbox about Google Web Toolkit. And uh, now it seems what uh, this is the only session which mentions uh, mention uh, Google Developer Toolkit. So uh, I want to ask: Is uh, Grid uh, is dead? No. Or not? Uh, I've been asked this question a lot, and. Um, if you look at Google, for example, uh, a lot of Google's like, um, top properties, actually, like AdWords, 97% of the revenue uh, it, you know, comes from the AdWords team, and AdWords uses GWT for their campaign management tool. And so it's impractical for us to say that, that GWT was dead, first of all. Uh, second of all, you know, GWT is about, I mean, Google is about choice. The company's about choice. So, you know, App Engine, for example, we offer um, Java, we offer um, Go, we offer Python. Well, we released Go recently, right? Does that mean that Guido Van Rossum's out of a job and Python's dead? No, it just means that there's another option for developers. And so uh, what I would say for GWT is, is that we're not going to take GWT away from you, and we're still going to support JavaScript development for V8, and we're still going to port, support GWT development. Um, but we're also offering this new option that might entice some people, maybe some people who don't like JavaScript, or maybe there are people who like JavaScript, but they want better tools for JavaScript. They want a, a, a really nice IDE for something that's a dynamic language. There's Dart for you. Or maybe they like Java, but they, you know, they're, maybe they're getting tired of doing enterprise apps. So uh, nothing's changing with, with GWT. In fact, uh, if you attend my session on Friday, there is actually some nice news that's going to be announced with respect to GWT's future. Okay. Any, anything else? Okay, thanks for coming, and uh, you're welcome. Be, be safe on your way down, rushing to get your devices. Don't trip and fall. <laughs>